Uh, yes, thanks. It's uh, Stephen Rankin. I wanted to ask one question about the prolif uh, proliferation of these very, very expensive residential units. Uh, Peter Rees, late uh, the planning leader for the City of London, has referred to these as uh, safety deposit boxes in the sky for sovereign wealth. Um, as it happens, I, I live near one, and no one lives there. Um, they're, they're empty, they're dark. And cities like Westminster and the City of London now are trying to struggle with how at once we welcome uh, this wealth to our cities, uh, but at the same time we make them actual places that people live and, and make it a part of an animated city. So maybe a comment from, from any one of you really on that. Well, I, do I need this? Do I need this? Um, this is a debate which has been much mooted in New York for, a, for uh, as long as the first projects have, have hit the press. Um, the, personally, I don't make any moral judgments. Again, rich people have to live somewhere. New York is on the ascendant. Uh, there is an enormous amount of global wealth which is looking to invest in New York. Uh, and as long as there's enough on the other side to balance, as there has been in the initiative of the new mayor, uh, Bill de Blasio, with affordable units and an initiative there in order to try to encourage the market, indeed mandate the market of new development in order to include affordable units, it seems like we can be inclusive and, and um, try to, to, uh, to satisfy both ends, and hopefully the middle will take care of itself. I took a tour uh, three days ago of 65 Leonard, which is one of the the, well, the 56. Herzog 56, 56, 56 mm -hmm. dyslexia. Um, and uh, the, the developer mentioned that 80% of the buyers are local. Uh, local, as in kind of neighborhood local, like Tribeca. below, below mm -hmm. 23rd Street. So I thought that was an interesting mm -hmm. uh, yeah. counter, counter to expectation statistic. Uh, so Carol presented uh, the set of conditions which drive this super slender tower. So I, I wanted to... You know, speak to Jamie and also hear from David. Just as design architects, what are what are their personal feelings about this building type, as a tall building and as a participant in the urban habitat? To uh, class them all together is difficult. is is a mistake uh, because, you know, like like most dense urban areas, Manhattan has great great variety of of needs per neighborhood. Per, per zone, towards the river, towards, towards the center of the island. I think that the towers around Central Park really can be uh, questioned because of this, not a right to light, but incidence of, of shadows on the park. E even if, when quantified, they're, they're small slivers and they're, it's not as much of a, a shadow as, as a big boxy building. I think New Yorkers have a right to ask that question. I think further down uh, on the island by the water, you know, what's wrong with the kind of San Gimignano like uh, architecture of the city? I think it's exciting and, you know, that it's great that New York continues to push. Uh, so we have, we have great things to engineer design and great places for people to live. I just think public space, outdoor space, should be the threshold of, of debate. I, I, I totally agree with that, but um, Anthony Wood made the, the point earlier in the conference that every place is different and a vernacular of the skyscraper exists or should exist within individual cities where you express the character of the place and there is really nothing more expressive of the vernacular of American capitalism, the delirious New York of uh, Ness of, uh, of, of the place than these new super slender towers. They, they represent this kind of Galapagos island, as I tried to illustrate, unique conditions of New York, the as of right conditions. So as long as there is democratic public space, the par Central Park is a place to go, I see no problem with um, letting the rules of the real estate game determine the way that people play Monopoly on the island of Manhattan. You ask about the urban habitat, and, and I think the urban habitat is not something that is only defined vertically and horizontally, but is mainly used by use uh, by people, and uh, mainly used by how people can uh, be allowed uh, to have that experience. 
I think one of the, the main issues uh, that you can see with kind of more and more vertical or pencil uh, towers, I live in Hong Kong, so I'm quite used to it. I'm, I'm not very surprised uh, uh, about uh, these, is these sketches. But what, what I think is really important is that they are extremely exclusive of uh, people um, being able to approach them and being able to connect the vertical and the horizontal of the city uh, together. And I think that is uh, a quest especially for planners and architects. It's, it's not about stopping uh, uh, them going higher, uh, stopping them becoming thinner, uh, but it is how do you connect uh, the different levels of the city uh, together and how can you make allow everybody uh, to go there. And I think that is something that in these luxury developments uh, is uh, forgotten. Even at the, the base of the towers, it's very often extremely exclusive. Maybe there's a small park or a small opening because of the regulations, but then kind of level two is immediately the sports and the swimming pool, and, but you can only be there when you have an apartment there, up there. So I think that is something we need to spend more time on as architects and urban planners, and then I think there's nothing wrong with having more height, um, but you should really be able to connect this uh, and this and not have them separately from each other. I've been in Dubai for a very long time and I've been associated with one of uh, the most uh, luxurious building, which is uh, the Pentominium, from the design to execution. And it's a slender building and it's supposed to be the thing for luxury. Uh, the only thing is that, that when we do such slender buildings, uh, financially it's a huge strain onto the developer because of the structure and what goes into it. But when you have a um, crisis like the economic crisis and the market fell, these buildings actually then do not get completed or they stand as a sole. So we, uh, maybe as a community, should actually guide these developers or these people that they shouldn't go in for such buildings. If, I think it's just ego driven all over the world that we go in for these buildings. How do we go about that? Or is there something that we call in developers also to such conferences to educate them that uh, we shouldn't do such things? No, I thought I was trying to make the point that uh, I don't believe it's ego-driven. I think it's money-driven. That is the form follows finance corollary in residential buildings that has driven commercial real estate and offices. I think it's, it's the nature of the historical building form of the high-rise that high demand for prime locations produces high prices. Um, and the only way that you change that is it has to do with the ownership of land and a political system. Um, I don't think that's likely to happen in New York, but perhaps there are other places where the opportunity exists for the clean slate to, um, to, to provide a more utopian uh, sharing uh, society. But, uh, uh, but I don't think that with the weight of history in New York that it's going to happen uh, there. Unfortunately, very often what the community has to say is not taken serious when it's about money. Uh, so you really have to kind of find a way that you don't talk about only what you feel is necessary to express, but also to connect it uh, to investment return, revenue, uh, and all that, uh, which I, I never came across in any public engagement. So it will be very hard to try to educate developers from a community perspective, uh, unless uh, everybody is willing to forget these dollars. I would just, just add, in looking at this for, from a, a longer range point of view, uh, a historical point of view, or looking further ahead, what we really should be worried about is the legacy of these buildings. If they're empty for a bit of time, does that matter as long as in 10, 20, 30, 40 years they will make a good piece of the armature of the city? And if, you, if finance or a bubble or some kind of legislation causes building in the Ninth Ward or building in a mudslide prone area or you know, it creates something that just can't sustain itself either environmentally or, or socially, that's one thing. But I think for the most part these towers in Manhattan, ex excepting this park issue, they don't detract long term from what the city will have to offer long after these developers have, have 
decided to bank their profits or they're retired or whatever. And I think those are the questions that, um, that we should be asking. Thank you.